Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm Richard Fields. On the program today, Joshua Thompson, Principal Attorney at Pacific Legal Foundation. Welcome to the show. And uh, uh, John Cameron, who is the author of Rewire and Rekill and a bunch of uh, uh, sales uh, manuals and books and uh, how-to things and the owner of CustomSalesTraining.com. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Uh, Pacific Legal Foundation uh, has just last week sued the Agricultural Labor Relations Board in, uh, in California uh, over uh, unions trespassing? That's right, Richard. The, there's a California regulation that allows union activists to cut across a business owner's property, an agricultural business's property, for the purpose of soliciting union members to, to get more, <laughs> more business to the union. And so what happens, in fact, is that uh, they enter the, the, the business's property with bullhorns and signs, cause a big ruckus, and all of this is authorized by this Agricultural Labor Relations Board regulation. So Pacific Legal Foundation filed a lawsuit saying that this regulation violates the Fourth and Fifth Amendments to the United States Constitution because under the Fourth Amendment, it, uh, it seizes property. Um, the, the union is allowed to enter onto the property. And under the Fifth Amendment, it takes it takes an interest, it takes an easement across these business owners' property um, without compensation. Now, I thought that was settled uh, back in the 1970s, shortly after the uh, Labor Relations Act uh, for farm workers was, was passed. The, the California Supreme Court upheld the regulation and said that this regulation, which allows trespass, imagine, for example, the, if, if people could just come into your home and you had no right to kick them out because under the regulation, they're legally there. That's they're, what this, they're organizing your children. <laughs> this is what this regulation allows. It allows trespass. It, it legalizes trespass, and the business owners have no right to kick out these trespassers. The California Supreme Court, soon after this regulation was enacted, upheld it and said that this did not violate, didn't even implicate constitutional rights. Um, however, we are bringing this case in federal court, and we're going to get the federal court to rule that this is a constitutional violation and. Uh, uh, Enjoin the regulation from having effect. So in the in the seventies, it was it was uh, argued on state uh, constitutional issues. No, they brought the the plaintiffs brought United States constitutional issues, but the the California Supreme Court, which has authority to rule under the United States Constitution, um, said that that this was not a, a, a constitutional violation. That um, the union and the Agricultural Labor Relations Board had every right to make this regulation and that constitutional rights simply weren't implicated. Was that a Roseburg court? Plan? It wasn't. It was right before Roseburg uh, oh. joined the court. Yeah. Can, I, can I ask a question? I, um, wasn't there Supreme Court issues about union access to workers? Um, and if I'm, I don't know whether it was California Supreme Court, but I saw Supreme Court and I didn't research it thoroughly. And they said that the only time that... Um, uh, it was legal for organizers to enter property as if there was no other way to effectively mm -hmm. contact the prospective union members and give them the information they needed to make um, um, a good decision. And the example they gave of the two cases where it, um, where uh, organizers were allowed to go to um, go onto the property was, uh, for example, a logging camp or a mining camp where, where, in essence, the people lived at their work site. So, for example, union organizers could, could go to um, an orbiting space station because, you know, <laughs> that would be where the guys lived and worked. But, you know, if they were rocket ferry pilots and went back and forth, they couldn't do it. So how, how has that been um, kind of perverted over the years to allow them to just have access on any property, or is it only in California that they can do that? Well, first off, you're absolutely right. The United States Supreme Court has ruled that that is the scenario when workers can, can the logging camp is a great example, when workers live on the property, there's no other means to communicate with them. And this was in 1980. Mm -hmm. Today we have, everybody has cell phones, um, nobody, especially my clients, don't have workers living on their property. I was going to ask that. It's not, it, one was a nursery, yeah. and the other was... Uh, Unless it's farm labor where people live, right. which no, they don't anymore, basically. Right. There's very little of that. Anyway, basically in non-existent in California. Yeah. And in fact, the nursery up in Doris, that is our client, houses their temporary labor um, in hotels in nearby Klamath Falls, Oregon. And in fact, the union could just 
as easily go to the hotel and talk to these workers. But mm -hmm. instead, they decided they would rather trample across the property rights. But to get to your earlier question, there, there is this great Supreme Court precedent saying that unions can only access and trespass across private property in limited circumstances when there's no other uh, reasonably available means to contact mm -hmm. the workers. However, those cases arise under the National Labor Relations Act. Um, and so the National Labor Relations Act recognizes private property rights and that unions cannot trespass across, across property. Um, in California, the Agricultural Labor Relations Board is a separate entity. It's not subject to the National Labor Relations Act. And that's why we're bringing constitutional claims um, that say, you know, regardless of whether the, the California Labor Relations Act allows this trespass, this trespass violates federal constitutional rights of our clients, and that's why we're trying to bring it in the federal court system. So you talked about trespass, because, um, yeah, our, our Constitution guarantees against um, basically your house, your home, your, your business is, is your castle, and without um, a court order or a warrant or something, and certainly mm -hmm. not, not um, uh, a civil organization like a labor union, they shouldn't have the ability to do that. So how can a state um, on non-elected uh, bureau bureaucracy and independent regulatory agency, in essence, get away with that? Because this is nobody's pushed them on it or? Well, for one, the S California Supreme Court upheld it. But I'd like to first address, I think your first point is important to reiterate that probably the core right in the property rights bundle is the right to exclude people you don't want there. Mm -hmm. If you didn't have that right, then property rights are essentially meaningless. If mm -hmm. people can come and trample across your rights, then what is a property right? So how is this allowed despite it being obviously unconstitutional under, the, under, under federal law? It's because it was challenged immediately after its enactment. It was challenged under federal constitutional grounds, which the California Supreme Court disregarded in a very, you know, the California Supreme Court has a sordid history of, you know, saying that Chinese people shouldn't be able to sit on juries and, and other really uh, egregious decisions. I would put this opinion up near the top of some of the worst opinions I've read as a lawyer. It does not recognize property rights, and because of that opinion, this regulation has gone unchallenged for 40 years. Tell us a little bit about uh, your clients in, in this case. So we represent two clients, uh, Cedar Point Nursery, it's a, uh, they grow starter strawberry plants, which they then sell to growers in, in California and Florida and nationwide to produce strawberries. Um, they're located in Northern California in Doris near the Oregon border. Our other client is Fowler Packing Company, which uh, grows mandarins, the Halo brand, which you can find mm -hmm. in grocery stores. Um, and uh, also they do, t they sell table grapes. And both of these clients in the past year have been subjected to this uh, onerous access regulation and have had union activists attempt to come onto their property. In the case of Cedar Point Nursery, um, if you go to uh, the website of the, of the place I work, Pacific Legal Foundation, you can see footage of these union activists coming in at 6 a.m. in the morning with bullhorns, scaring the workers, nobody knows what's going on, and just trespassing and and causing a ruckus at, at their business. And, and this is and during, I'm, harvest, I'm, I'm, during, during harvest, harvest season, season right? I'm assuming uh, yeah. pretty much disrupting. Yeah, the, they, uh, have an eight, they have a short eight-week harvest season, and their business is contingent on ensuring that they get those plants out to the growers as soon as possible. So you imagine if you have eight days, eight weeks to complete your entire harvest for the year, any day that is disrupted in this fashion is, is a big blow to the business. Moving on to uh, other uh, big news in the legal sphere, uh, uh, Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia uh, passed away uh, last uh, weekend, or the weekend of the uh, what, 12th, 13th or 14th of uh, February. And that's going to have, it's already had some huge effects, not only in, uh, in the judicial uh, arena, but also in the political arena with, uh, uh, with uh, the Republicans saying we're not going to, or at least uh, some of the Republicans saying we're not going to confirm anybody. With uh, Obama saying I'm going to uh, nominate somebody, and you darn well better confirm somebody. And I'm guessing it's going to turn into uh, probably the political issue in the presidential campaign. Is that kind of the the, the uh, prediction that you would make? 
Yeah, it's certainly, certainly for the segment of, of the population that I hang around with, the, the Supreme Court is such an important part of, of my career and, and how I view uh, political elections. And, uh, you know, Scalia was such a force on the Supreme Court. In a lot of ways, he brought Supreme, uh, Supreme Court decisions to the masses. He could write these witty, uh, witty opinions that the layperson could read. Um, he had a strong belief in property rights. I think, you know, libertarians would certainly object to some of his opinions. But uh, by and large, he was a... Uh, bit more on social issues. Yeah. He was a, but, you know, he, he, he authored a lot of great Fourth Amendment opinions that... You know, conservatives may disagree with, but you know, liberals would tend to agree with. But say on, on gay marriage and abortion, he was very strictly more conservative. But regardless of of, of his views, he was a he was a, a amazing figure. He was an excellent writer. He opened the court up, and his personality uh, is something to behold. And losing some a giant legal mind like Scalia um, is certainly a blow to the Supreme Court and the next. Appointee has big shoes to fill. If uh, Obama has any hope of all at all of getting a, uh, a nomination uh, confirmed uh, while he's uh, a lame duck, it would have to be a moderate. Do you are, are you seeing any names being preferred that uh, uh, could in any way, uh, shape, or form uh, pull off the, th the half a dozen well, Obama Republican himself. Republican yeah. <laughs> Republican yeah. votes? Hey, that, I've I've yeah. seen a couple of people say he'd make a great Supreme Court justice. Yeah, Hillary said that. <laughs> uh, well, I've, I've heard the name Sri Srinivasan bantered around, who actually ruled against me in one of my cases, a case that I have since petitioned in the Supreme Court. Um, and he's, you know, he was he was confirmed by the Senate in ninety-seven to zero vote, so he had strong support from both sides, or at least didn't have uh, strong anti-support. Okay. And uh, what was the case that he ruled against you? It was Shea versus Kerry. It was a. It was a discrimination case brought under Title VII where we argued that um, the State Department's race-based hiring policy violated uh, the Civil Rights Act. So he was much in favor of uh, enforcing reverse discrimination. Did you say State Department, a department of a state, or no, the State Department? The State Department. Oh, <laughs> uh, I didn't know they did that. Yeah, well, they, they, they did uh, to my client, and uh, that was upheld as not a Title VII violation. I, you know... We took that case to, to, you know, say something nice about Judge Srinivasan. We took that case knowing that we wanted to take it to the Supreme Court and reverse, uh, reverse bad precedent. So you can make the case that Srinivasan was simply following precedent that was already established, and that doesn't necessarily speak towards whether he would be a very liberal or a very conservative justice. Um, but to your earlier point. Even someone moderate like Srinivasan, who everybody recognizes as a brilliant legal mind and is, is very fair and who I have great respect for, I don't think that someone like that will be confirmed by a Republican Senate um, when they are losing such a figure like Scalia. Any, any moderate is going to shift the court in a decidedly liberal direction. And the Republicans hopefully uh, grow a backbone and recognize that and aren't willing to... Uh, Confirm a moderate. How much court. confidence do you have in a, uh, say, a Trump appointee? None. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I rock, just rock to, and hard place here. <laughs> I have uh, to throw in some humor on this. I saw I get uh, people I'm supposed to follow on Twitter. I don't remember what one of them was. My my daughter sends me socialist crap because she's you know she was celebrating Scalia's death. I thought she was going to sacrifice a lamb or something. And um, so it said, uh, uh, latest news, the um, Republican Party is uh, turning psychotic or something like that. Um, Obama has threatened to resign um, in order to be a Supreme Court justice. So they're torn between... <laughs> Getting rid of Obama sooner than they could, or the or the craziness of having him on the Supreme Court. Now, I didn't do it very well, but it was when I saw it, I just cracked. Up. Assuming a lengthy uh, confirmation process, which I think we can assume under any circumstance, we'll have an eight-member Supreme Court. What uh, effect will an eight-justice court have on you know? Assuming there's some four-four votes, will it have on some of the the cases that the Pacific Legal, for instance, has pending? Uh, starting out with uh, Murr versus the state of Wisconsin. 
Before we get to Murr, I'd like to mention Fisher versus University of okay. Texas, sure. which Go is, uh, you know, when I first heard the news, I, I thought, oh, oh, crap, here's our, here's our chance to really put a dent in race-based affirmative action, and now we lost Scalia, it's really going to be a 4-4 vote. What I forgot to realize at the time is Justice Kagan has already recused herself in that case. So Scalia, the loss of Scalia really means nothing, regardless of... of so you're looking for a 4-3. We're looking for a 4-3 in that. It's still going to matter how Kennedy votes. It's going to be the, the swing vote in that case. But a case like Murr is a lot more troubling. This is a case, um, it's a property rights case on an issue that Pacific Legal Foundation has been fighting for, for 30 years. And we finally got the court to accept a case. Um, we felt really strongly that you know, with the composition of the court when certiorari was granted that we could get a good decision. But now losing someone like Scalia, who authored some very famous property rights decisions like Nolan versus California Coastal Commission, it really, it, it very easily... Which is being completely ignored, by the way. Yeah. I mean. Yeah. The, uh, quickly, the facts of this case is uh, these, these, this family owns a parcel of, two adjacent parcels of land. Um, they want to develop the undeveloped parcel. And... Um, the Wisconsin appellate court said that they that the government could take that entire parcel and not pay them any money for it because when you view the two parcels jointly, the government is only taking half of, of, of the property value. And if the government's only taking half, you still have a lot that you can work with. It's not a taking under the Fifth Amendment. So, so half, half isn't a taking? Half is not a taking uh, under most circumstances. But... But what they were actually doing is they were taking the entire parcel. It was just, and these were separate parcels, separate legal parcels, um, and always had been, and the government took one of them away and the court viewed them jointly. So this is a, it's a relevant parcel issue that comes up frequently in, in cases that we litigate. And we were very, very confident, but with the passing of Scalia, it, it really <coughs> throws a question mark. The case could very well come down 4-4. Of course, we hope that we still get a 6-2 or a 7-1 or a 8-0 opinion, but, um, you, if, it, if it's 4-4, four, four, there, there's a lot of things that could happen. Um, the, the Supreme Court could issue a 4-4 four, four decision, in which case the lower court opinion stands. The court could hold off and uh, re-argue when they get a ninth justice appointed to the court. Um, there, there are a number of different scenarios that could happen, but it's, it's certainly a disappointment in that respect. And the, uh, the appellate court decision is uh, unfavorable. It was. The, the, the case never made it to the Wisconsin Supreme Court, the Wisconsin Court of Appeals uh, held that this was not a taking because you can combine the two properties and then it's only taking half the value, um, which frankly is not that revolutionary. Um, but uh, we feel like this, when you're taking 100% of one parcel, it should be considered a total taking. Um, and the Wisconsin Supreme Court never heard the case. Mm -hmm. So yeah. we petitioned after Wisconsin Supreme Court denied, we petitioned the United States Supreme Court to hear the case and they accepted it. We were very excited. It's just a couple months ago and now, unfortunately, Scalia, with Scalia's passing, we're obviously gonna argue the case um, diligently. We have a great lawyer, John Groen, who will be arguing the case um, and we have great facts and we have justice on our side. So hopefully those things will win out despite the loss of Scalia. Another case from the upper Midwest is in, in Minnesota. It's Hawks uh, Company versus the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers about, about mining peat in a wetland. And I, always kind of thought that Pete is only found in a wetland. Am I wrong on that? Uh, you're the Minnesotan. You can tell me uh, where Pete grows. It's not something that I know. But, but, um, but you know, this case is, is important because what the government is doing here is the government is saying that you are, your property is a wetland, and they say, no, this isn't a wetland. This is, this is according to the, the, the statutory definition of wetland, our land does not meet that definition. Um, and the government said, well, okay, but you can't do anything about it because we said so. So you would think, well, why don't they just sue and say that it's not a wetland? Well, the government says, you're not allowed to sue us. You have three options. You can either leave your land fallow and not do anything with it. You can uh, violate what we say and, and or you, can, you have two options. You can either leave your land fallow and not do anything. I'm sorry, you do have three options. You can apply for a permit and after $100,000 in five years, maybe we'll give you a permit to do something on your land. But probably not. But probably not. Or three, you can uh, just develop as you would, but if it turns out to be a wetland, you'll face 
hundreds of thousands of dollars in fines. So those are your three options. And the, the Hawks company said, well, no, we're going to sue and we're going to say that this isn't a wetland um, because you're making a determination over our property that affects our rights and we should be able to uh, take our case to federal court. Um, in a very impressive opinion, it's, it's, it's something that Pacific Legal Foundation has been litigating uh, a lot and something we've tried to uh, get the courts to recognize that you should be able to have your, your federal rights heard in this matter. The Eighth Circuit did say that you could bring, it was the first circuit to hold that you could bring these, these types of claims in federal court. Unfortunately, the, uh, the government petitioned the United States Supreme Court to hear it and that case was, was taken up. But I'm a little more confident despite the loss of Scalia and Hawks, because you may recall uh, three years ago, Pacific Legal Foundation won a, a case with very similar facts called Sack Sackett versus Environmental Protection Agency, where the government prevented uh, the Sacketts from their day in court. And that opinion was 9-0. It was the unanimous decision saying that the Sacketts were entitled to their day in court. So we're hoping that even with the loss of Scalia, we can get a victory in Hawks. And it was a win at the circuit level, so a 4-4 would also be a win. That's true. A 4-4 would also uphold the... The, the, the Sackett, um, talk about Scalia and his comments, he eviscerated the, the, uh, the government on that one. Yeah, he there, said he couldn't, couldn't believe that something like this could happen in the United States. That's right. That's right. Uh, you may be thinking it was a very famous quote by Justice Alito during the argument that he said. Oh, maybe it was Alito. Yeah, he said he, he asked the counsel for the EPA. He said, you know, if you told this to an ordinary person, if you told this story to an ordinary person on the street, they would think like something like this can't happen in America. But it happened, it did. And in, 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 in Sackett, our clients were facing $75,000 a day in fines and couldn't couldn't bring their case in Yeah, court. on a $23,000 lot when yeah. we were trying to build a $150,000 or cut $200,000 home. Outrageous. That's crazy. Uh, another case, this is one, I think we're uh, your amicus, the Friedrichs case, Friedrichs versus the California uh, Teachers Association. How does that one look with a, a Scalia-less court? <laughs> this is probably the, the direst of the three. Um, I think after the oral argument in this case, this case challenges whether whether union shop fees for, for California teachers um, violate the First Amendment. And of course, uh, um, after, the, after the oral argument, uh, most of the pundits and, and were, were thinking that we were going to win this case. It's something that we've been trying to uh, get overturned for 40 years since a, a Abood decision um, uh, in the 70s. And, uh, but we were expecting a 5-4 opinion, and uh, Scalia's loss really calls into question how the court will rule. If hopefully, I would hope that they would hold off on issuing a ruling and maybe order re-argument after uh, Gary Johnson gets elected next year. <laughs> um, but uh, I might be uh, hoping for unicorns. <laughs> so a question about the Friedrichs versus California Teachers Association. So. That, that um, one is a loss of the, the, at the appellate level? Yes. Okay. Um, Non-union teachers, if there are such things, <laughs> people that don't belong to the Communist Teachers Association, as I like to call them, um, are we still required to pay union dues? And part of those dues are used to um, promote communism, I guess, since it's the Communist Teachers Association. Is that... Well, the, the teachers' union says no. That we separate out the money that we get. We have we have members that can say we're only going to have our money support um, the collective bargaining efforts, and we're not going to support the lobbying efforts. The reality is, though, everything that the California teachers' union spends money on is inherently political. When they lobby the government to get more pay for their teachers, when they lobby the government to get more vacation time. These are political mm -hmm. things. And if you're a non, uh, if, if you don't want to support the union's political causes, you, and, and you still have to pay to, to support those things, you're still paying for political speech that you don't support. So we would argue that everything that a public sector union does is subject to First Amendment protections. And therefore, you cannot require individuals to, su to subsidize speech that they fundamentally disagree with. Hmm. Okay. One final fun topic. You wrote a <laughs> blog post on the Asian American Portland rock band called The Slants. What was that all about? The Slants are a rock band from Portland, and they, uh, they're, they're fronted by a man named Simon Tam. 
Asian American, and uh, he decided to call his band The Slants because he wanted to own the disparaging uh, comment um, that, uh, that the name implies. Um, he sought to trademark his name, as many bands do. You can't name your band The Rolling Stones today because that is a trademark name. And uh, so he went to trademark The Slants, and the government said, no, you're not allowed to trademark that because we, we think that's a disparaging term, and you're not allowed to trademark disparaging terms. Um, so basically what the government is saying is, we don't like the words you're using, and we're not going to allow you to use them. And so he brought a First Amendment challenge, and in a very important case that, has, uh, that will have wide-ranging effects, particularly on the NFL that we all know has trademarked the Redskins, um, the court said, the government can't pick and choose what are the bad words and what are the good words. That's a, that's a content-based restriction on speech, and that uh, violates the First Amendment and struck down this entire trademark law that allows the government to censor speech that it finds offensive. So dirty white boys, you couldn't be a band because that's disparaging the fatties. Uh, <laughs> rednecks. Um, no, there's a Hitler who's called themselves a redneck, but you can't, but you can't, uh, you can't, uh, you can't trademark it. Yeah, well, it's funny. The the one of the great arguments that the slants had in this case is they, if you read their briefs, they have a litany of things that the trademark office did end up patenting that were just as offensive and things that I'm not comfortable saying uh, on uh, recorded television, but very things that you, would th that you couldn't hear over the airwaves were, would be trademark, and, but then you would have the, the trademark office picking and choosing other bad words that it thought were not trademarkable. And so it, it's truly a case of the government choosing randomly um, and uh, capriciously the words that it thinks that people shouldn't be saying. Now, is this a case that you're involved in, in, in any way, other than writing about it? Well, oh, I've, I've actually talked with, with Mr. Tam, the, the, the lead singer to the band, but um, uh, we did not file a brief in the case. If it goes to the Supreme Court, so this, the, the Federal Circuit issued an opinion earlier this year and uh, held that this was a First Amendment violation, if it ends up going to the Supreme Court, uh, we will get involved. Okay, so that's where it, where it is at this point. Um, anything else you'd like to, to add to, I mean, what kind of music do they do? Is it, is it good music to listen to? It's kind of, it's, it's, uh, it's indie, it's got some punk, it's got some dance, um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's not what I would listen to, but it's, it's perfectly pleasant. You can have a few bars if you want to. <laughs> That's the show for this week. We'll see you again next week on Libertarian Counterpoint on the air on Channel 17 in Sacramento and on the web at uh, accesssacramento.org uh, at uh, 8 p.m. Thursday noon, Friday, and 4 a.m. on Saturday, all Pacific time, and also on cable channels all over the place. So check your local listings for, uh, for time and channel. Thank you very much for being part of the show.